Good evening. How does capitalism warp the way we think? How does it warp our understanding of the world? This is not an easy question to answer because we're in the middle of it. And we can't tell what it's doing to our minds. Somebody in the future will be able to look back and say it all too easily, but I'm afraid we're a bit stuck with it. But we have some clues. We have some experiments that allow us to get an idea about just what is going wrong in our heads because of the way we live. One of the clues came out uh, this month. There's a paper in the Proceedings of the uh, Academy of American Scientists uh, that was published and I think received some attention today. About 600,000 people whose Facebook news entries have been altered to see what effect it might have on their mood. And one group of them, without their knowledge, had more of the bad news from their friends promoted upwards. And another group had more of the good news from their friends promoted upwards, they saw it first. And it won't surprise you to find out this affected their behavior, it affected what they post. We're all affected by the environment we live in. When I read about that survey, uh, the stunning thing is finding out that whenever you sign on to Facebook, you actually give permission to be experimented on. It, it made me think of a meeting I sat in in the 1990s in Newcastle, where people were talking about what can we do about Newcastle, we've run out of industry, there aren't enough jobs, what are we going to do for people? And somebody actually suggested, only half jokingly, why don't we put something in the water? That'll, that'll calm them down if we put the thing that you get in tea in the water. And I thought, what happens if they start doing that with Facebook? We could get you all to be a bit more placid if we simply alter the kind of news you're getting from your friends to make you not worry so much about the world. I'm going to show you some other clues. Here's a couple of photographs. They're taken of a uh, match, a cricket match between Eton and Harrow. These are all Harrow boys. You can tell because they have canes, in case you ever need to know the difference. Um, one is taken just before the outbreak of the First World War, and you can see them all looking quite confident up there. The other is taken a few years before the start of the Second World War, and they're looking a lot more nervous. Now, obviously, a whole number of photographs could have been taken. What matters about these are these are the ones that the newspapers of the, of the day chose to show. And they showed different pictures, I would argue, because the times were changing. The little graph up there at the top is showing you the share of income of the best off 1% in the country, which way back 100 years ago was around a quarter of all income, reduced dramatically between the wars, fell down to a low of around about 6% when I was a child. I grew up at a time of great equality, and it's now buck up to 15%. And we can look at that change of how unequal we are to see how we might have behaved differently in different times of greater competition, of more capitalism, if you like. You can also look across countries, and that can provide you with a clue as to how we're affected by our times and by our environment. We all think that we're educated in, an, in a fairly normal way. We tend to think of our times as normal because, of course, that is the definition of normal. It's what goes on most of the time. But if you have a little look at the ranking of our ability on average to do maths by the time we reach young adulthood, you'll see there's a remarkable difference between countries. And the countries at which, where people do best, Finland and the Netherlands, tend to be the much more equal countries. The countries where we're most enumerate, I'm afraid, is us. Italy, for some reason, I'm never quite sure about and the United States. And these are really big differences. You've got confidence limits there, so these are, these are very, very different. Have a think about our school systems. Have a think about the differences in these countries. You'll know that in Finland, almost everybody goes to the same kind of school, are taught the same kind of way. There are very few tests. Teachers are well respected. The kids come out doing very well. In contrast, we have a highly segregated school system. It depends on how much money you can afford as to whether you can live near a good school. And if you've got a lot of money, you can completely segregate yourself away. 
And then we give ourselves lots and lots of tests, enormous number of tests. If you've got small children, they'll come home from school telling you how they're a 5B or a 6C. And then they get their GCSEs, and then they get their A-levels, and we give them A-stars, and so on and so on. And all the time, we're not doing very well. But we give ourselves lots and lots of prizes for how good we are educationally. So I would argue that capitalism actually changes our ability to learn and to do things, and that more we have, the more we're tied into a system of competition, the worse we actually get, not just on average, but if you compare the supposedly best of people, they do less well in a country like Britain as opposed to some of the Scandinavian nations. Your little graph up there is about what people say about themselves. There's a whole series of lovely international tests where we ask people, are you a better driver than average? Are you cleverer than average? Are you better looking than average? Are you more interestingly socially than average? And then you can see how many people in each country say they're better than average. And what you find is that the more unequal a country is, the more people say they're much better than average. Partly because you have to. It's quite hard to get on when you're told to compete all the time if you don't have a high opinion of yourself. But what happens in aggregate when everybody starts thinking that they're that much better than most other people around them? What kind of society does that create? And what happens to the poor sods at the top? The little picture there is showing you these people where their size has actually been made proportional to their salaries. Uh, and that banker, I don't think, had a very good time as a result of all of this. We start talking about people and thinking about people in, in different ways under capitalism. We talk of people who are not doing very well who are losing out as shirkers and skivers and simply being less worthy. We talk about people at the top as wealth creators, people who somehow magically make money out of nothing and then create lots and lots of jobs for other people. We rarely say, well, if they're creating so many jobs, why are there so many people who don't have jobs? Or actually look at what are the nature of the jobs that they're creating. We tend to buy into a particular way of thinking about human beings that begins to value us all very, very differently. From those who are worth a huge amount, those who are worth a lot less, to those who really are just a liability and it's only out of charity that we keep them going. We've all stepped down recently. You have to add two noughts to that little cartoon from the 1920s. Um, and I think one way of seeing what happens when we all step down is that if you're at the bottom, that's why you have food banks again. That's why we have had a rise in absolute poverty. And we then blame it on the people at the bottom who we've cut from the most. The nature of what we do changes. If you ever get a chance, and of course you'll get a chance, just stop for two minutes at a bus station or a railway station and look at all the people going past you and think, what are they going to do? Where are they going to work? What is happening in their lives today? About one in 10 of us in Britain work in retail. It's a very high proportion. And a lot of it is standing around in shops, occasionally asking people if they'd like some help so that they can be persuaded to buy something they might not otherwise buy. A lot of our lives are about trying to get people to buy things they don't necessarily want. That's advertising. We have twice as much advertising as the average European, but half as much as the average American. It changes the nature of your society. I've still got to check if these stats are true, because I, I couldn't believe them when I saw them reported in the press. But two years ago, apparently one in four of all new jobs in Britain were working in the state agency. Last year, it was one in three of all new jobs. Showing somebody around a house for half an hour and then another couple around a house for half an hour, and then another couple around a house for half an hour. The same house again and again and again, telling various lies about how wonderful this property is and why it's worth such an enormous amount of money, and how the housing market never goes down, and you really should buy it, but you need to overbid to have a chance. It's not a very fulfilling thing to be doing. A lot of what we do is not very fulfilling. Let's just have a little look at the housing market. 
Because I, I do think it's interesting how the world we live in changes what we think. This apparently is not a bubble. This is a map of the country where we've just taken the boroughs of London and the regions of England and made each the size of the increase in house values in 2013. And you'll see that in practice, the whole of London rose more in value than the whole of the North East and North West and Yorkshire and Humberside in just one year. And by the way, this is a much smaller rise than the one that's going on at the moment. The one that I had called 17%, but it's now heading up towards 20% rises. But apparently, according to the governor of the Bank of England, this isn't a bubble. Don't worry about it. This is normal. This is, this is what it's actually worth. Were it to continue to 2033 at this rate, you'd be looking at an average price of £10 million for a London house. I don't think it's particularly sustainable, but think in a particular way. Think about markets as something that really worked or supposedly reach equilibrium, and it's okay, it might just need a little bit of calming down, but don't worry about it too much. The way we live affects all kinds of aspects of our lives. Uh, up here I've put a graph for you. It's almost my last graph, sorry for lots of these, but I kind of feel the need because people don't tend to believe you unless you show them some of these things. This is life expectancy against wealth inequality. Now it's not that the most unequal countries by wealth distribution are necessarily directly going out and giving people something that makes them live shorter lives. It's a complicated relationship between the kind of society you get when you're very unequally resourced and your overall health. A good example is how hard it is to get doctors to live and work in poor areas in Britain because they tend not to have grown up in poor areas. They tend to find them a bit scary and they don't want to live there. In a much more equal country, that isn't a problem because you do not have huge gaps between rich and poor areas. So you can get your doctors in the right place and if you believe that doctors do anything for your health, it's quite good to have doctors near everybody, not simply concentrated amongst those who are well off. There'll be all kinds of reasons why we get this kind of relationship. But down here, the problem is we begin to say it's okay if people don't try hard enough to live long enough, well, that's their own fault. Whereas up here, people have a different idea of each other. They tend to respect each other more. They tend not to think it's okay if some go to the wall and others don't. My last graph for reasons to be optimistic as my time begins to run out. This is temporary. Capitalism has not been around for a very long time. It will not be around forever. It's a particular way of living. It's a particular way of organizing things economically, which is obviously unsustainable. We benefited from it more than most people because we were in that continent which happened to be where it sparked off when the Americas were discovered and the trigger, the trigger to making money out of trade began. But our time of doing well out of capitalism is coming to an end. If you want a reason to help you think it's coming to an end, the growth of capitalism, the growth of trade, the growth of prices being all important and other things not being important, is almost perfectly coincident with the worldwide explosion in human beings. When capitalism spread, it disrupted normal systems around the world so that people's population began to grow and grow and get larger. Enclosure did that, colonization did that, all kinds of changes did that. And as people had more children than they normally had, your market as a producer of goods got bigger and bigger every year. You didn't have to be very good. You only had to be as good as you were the year before, and there were more people to buy what you're selling. So it could work. The good news is that that all ended around about 1970. Around about 1970, our population growth stopped rising. It began to slow. Some people noticed that in 1970. They worked out that if we carried on growing at the rates we were growing in 1970, then within 300 years, the entire planet would be a seething mass of bodies, all of them touching each other. It was simply unsustainable. We hit peak baby about 1990. We're about peak teen now. World population is going to slow down, stop, maybe reverse,
about 2050, maybe 2100. The ability to make more and more money is coming to an end, and as it comes to an end, how we think about each other and how we think about the world is going to change. We have no idea how it's going to change, but thinking it's going to carry on like this, I think you don't have to worry about that. You have to worry about what is going to come. Thank you very much.